In today's video, we shall be discussing about intervention radiology, stents, balloon catheters, and uh, the role of radiation protection uh, and uh, what we need to be careful about and what's, uh, we'll, uh, we'll bust a couple of myths in terms of radiation protection. Uh, without, any without wasting any further time, I'd uh, request our speaker today, Dr. Rajesh Vedunath Nair. Uh, he's an intervention radiologist from uh, currently practicing in Kuwait. He's done a few, couple of lectures for us before this. I'll leave a link to those in the description you can check them out uh, once you're finished watching this lecture. Over to you, Dr. Rajesh Venunath. Thank you, Dr. Amar. So welcome back to this third and last session for, of intervention radiology discussion regarding hardwares and tools. And in today's uh, discussion, we'll, have, uh, we'll be discussing about stents, balloons, and a bit of contrast media and radiation safety in IR. So in my last class, I had discussed about embolization. And in today's class, we'll be discussing more on the vascular stenting and angioplasties. So coming to the first topic that is stent. So stent is nothing but a scaffolding or a mesh framework that provides support and stability to a collapsible structure. So the stent is a novice term. It was not there before. Only after the development of interventional radiology has this term stents been uh, like brought up into the English lit uh, dictionary. So stents are nothing but scaffolding or mesh framework that provide support and stability to a collapsible structure like a vessel wall. And they are hollow flex flexible radiopic tubes of expandable framework. And usually they are made up of nitinol. Nitinol is nothing but a nickel titanium hybrid alloy. And there are two types of stents that are used in vascular intervention radiology. They are either covered or uncovered. So the metal, it has a metal framework. And if it is covered by a fabric, it is called a covered stent. And if it is, a bare, if it is not covered by a fabric, it is called a bare metal stent. And the stents are usually deployed over a stiff guide wire because the stents uh, have to negotiate uh, and to provide the stability, you have to pass it over a stiff guide wire and it comes with a long sheet. And the deployment of the stent is also through the sheath. So it, you have a pin and pull mechanism where you uh, place the stent in the desired location and you pull the sheath back and the stent will get deployed. And stents are usually available in various lengths and sizes and it comes along with the delivery system. So based on the type of manufacturer, you have different types of stents with different delivery systems and uh, how to deploy them will be given along with the literature available with the stents. And the stents are usually longer when they are packed and once they are deployed, they foreshorten when they are fully expanded within the body. And if there are two types of stents, you have self-expanding metal stents as well as balloon expandable stents based on the deployment. Either they have to be deployed with the help of a balloon or they <clears throat> expand on their own when they come in contact with the body temperature. And if it's a balloon expandable stent that you're using, you should make sure that the stent is expanded from proximal to distal part. Otherwise, if you expand from the distal to the proximal, you have that the stent, you, you, can, you will notice that the stent is getting migrated and displaced from, and you will not be able to place it in the desired location. And stealth expanding metal stents, they expand when they, uh, they expand to full body, uh, full diameter when it comes in contact with the body temperature. So when, once inside the body, because of the body temperature, they, the metal tends to expand. That is called, that is a property of self expanding metal stents. And based on the morphology of the stents, they are classified as hybrid stents, fenestrated stents, and branch stents. Fenestrated stents are stents that have holes to allow, uh, allow passage of blood through the, into the branch vessels. And branch stents are nothing but if you have aortic interventions, the abdominal aorta divides into celiac, so you have a main stent and two branch stents. And hybrid stent is nothing but the tip stent is a prototype of hybrid stent in which part of the stent is covered and part is uncovered. So in the tips, when you pass, uh, you have to create an artificial tract through the hepatic parenchyma, extending from the hepatic vein to the portal vein. So the part of the stent that is within the parenchyma is covered and the part of the stent which is within the portal vein is uncovered. So this is a hybrid stent. So coming to um, the stent design and nomenclature, so the stand design, you have to know certain basic terms and uh, certain basic structures which are used for making up uh, making up a stand. So stand is nothing but there are a lot of twigs that are arranged in a zigzag manner that forms the basic framework of the stand. So these uh, twigs are called as struts. The struts they have different lengths and they come in variable thickness. And the struts are usually in, uh, the the struts are usually zigzag and these corners are called as crowns. And the crowns are usually interconnected with the help of connectors. 
So based on the arena and this closed lattice structure, when the crown is interconnected with the help of the uh, connectors, it is called a cell. And once the cell, multiple cells together, they form a complete ring. So you have the struts, which is, uh, which is in a zigzag manner. The struts are connected with the help of interconnectors at the crown. And a closed loop, closed loop structure, when multiple struts are connected together, that forms a cell and multiple cells together forms a ring. So this is a basic framework of arrangement of this tent and based on the way the connectors and the rings are attached, they, they, there'll be multiple designs for this tent based on the requirement. <clears throat> and the stand, uh, this is a picture showing how a balloon expandable stand is. The balloon is usually inside the stand and the center is on the outer aspect. And once you inflate the balloon with the help of contrast, the stand expands and it uh, comes in contact with the vessel wall. And once the balloon is deflated, the stand will remain in position because of the tensile strength. And, um, and once the stand is deployed, the balloon can be deflated and removed. So what are the properties of a stent material? The ideal properties of stent platform should be that it should be non-corrosive, it should be low thrombogenic, it, it, it should be easily positionable, it should have a high flexibility because the vessels usually have a torturous core, so it has to negotiate through the torturosity. It should have a high radial strength, it should have a low elastic recoil. So these two are the most important properties. It should have a high radial strength and a low elastic recoil. It should be uniform in caliber with uh, no chances of stenosis. It should have a low crossing profile. That is the tip of the balloon should, uh, tip of the stand should be as small as possible so as to negotiate through the vessels. And the most important factor is the cost because stands are very relatively expensive if it is imported. So uh, in-house manufacturing of the stands is considered because uh, it will help to reduce the cost of the procedure. So they say that if the intervention procedure, at least one third of the cost is taken up by the stent. So if you can reduce the cost of the stent, you can uh, reduce the cost of the procedure. So coming to classification of stents, stents are broadly classified as vascular and non-vascular stent. Uh, example of a good example of a non-vascular stent is the DJ stent that we use for the ureters. And based on the way the stents are deployed, they can be balloon mounted stent or self-expanding stents. Uh, self-expanding self stent is a biliary stent, uh, which is also called a wall stent. They have the property of self-expansion when it comes in contact with the biliary system. And be, in, based on whether the uh, stent is coated with drugs or not, you have the drug eluting and the non-drug eluting stents. The drugs are usually coated onto the stent as paclitaxel. These drugs, they prevent uh, uh, endothelial proliferation and stent occlusion. So the stent patency is increased if it is drug coated. However, the cost of the stents, drug coated stents are high. And if based on uh, whether the fabric is present or not, they can be covered stents as well as uncovered stents. So if it is an aneurysm or a vessel rupture that you have to repair, it is better to go for a covered stent and all other peripheral vascular interventions we use a bare metal stent. So these are the principles of stent deployment and uh, stents are usually deployed in cases where the narrowing or occlusion is more than 70%. So if there is 70% to 90% narrowing of the vessel, a simple angioplasty may not suffice because the vessel will collapse due to the elastic recoil. So you have to pass a stent. And uh, what, is the achieve, what is the end point that you write, or would like to achieve in case of uh, 70 to 90% occlusion is that? Uh, from the 70 to 90 percent occlusion, you have to put a stent and reduce the, uh, I mean, increase the uh, diameter of the vessel and make the occlusion to less than 30 percent. So this is the, from 70 percent, it should become less than 30 percent. That is the principle of angioplasty and stenting. And uh, how do you, uh, 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 how do you go for stent deployment is that if you have a stenosis, you have to first cross, cross the stenosis with the help of a wire. So you can take the help of a suitable shaped catheter and a wire. Usually you, uh, you, it is very difficult to cross the stenosis with a stiff wire. You have to use a hydrophilic thermo wire of suitable diameter. If an O3-5 wire doesn't pass, you have to go for a smaller wire like O14 or O18. And once the uh, wire is passed, you have to pass a suitable catheter through the stenosis. Then you have to exchange the wire for a stiff wire. And then you angioplasty this uh, plug with the help of a balloon. And once the plasty is done, to a suitable diameter, you, have, you can pass the stent and deploy it. So this is a stenosis which has been crossed and plastied. Then the stent is deployed. This is a balloon mounted stent. So once a balloon is expanded, the uh, stent 
gets adherent to the wall. And once the balloon is removed, the vessel remains patent and the plaque is extruded from the circulation. From a stenosis of this much diameter, the vessel diameter has become to near normal size. Now, what are the uses of stents? Stents are mainly used to maintain the patency of the vessel. In non-vascular procedures, they are used to provide alternate drainage pathway. And the most important use of stent is in the treatment of aneurysms to exclude the aneurysm sac from the circulation. They can be used in the treatment of both the saccular as well as fusiform aneurysms. And the stent-assisted coiling is also a useful technique for treatment of aneurysms, especially in neurointerventions. And uh, stent is also used for the removal of blood clots from the brain. And this is, forms the basis of mechanical thrombectomy in cases of treatment of stroke. So there is a, a device called the stent retriever, which is used to retrieve the clots from the middle cerebral artery and the anterior cerebral artery. And this forms the basis of stroke treatment if the patient comes within the four hours window period. And stent grafts are used in emergency management of accidental vessel rupture during angioplasty. Suppose if you're doing an angioplasty and the vessel accidentally rupture, you, uh, stents are a bailout device because you have to close the patch or the defect with the help of a stent graft or covered stents. Now, uh, when you talk about stent, the prototype procedure is TIPS or transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt, where you create an artificial channel for passage of blood from the portal vein into the hepatic vein and right atrium through the liver parenchyma. Uh, because the sinusoids are blocked and the portal blood is not able to flow into the right atrium, you create an alternate pathway. So what you do is that you access from the jugular into the hepatic vein, usually the right hepatic vein is preferred. Once you have cannulated the right hepatic vein, you can take the pressures and uh, you can that forms a baseline. Uh, you can know the baseline pressure, which is called HBPG, hepatic vein portal gradient. And uh, what you do is that you can pass a needle through the hepatic vein and try to puncture the right branch of portal vein. This is usually done with the help of ultrasound guidance. And once you pass the, into the right branch of portal vein, uh, you can pass the wire and the sheet through into the portal vein branch. As you can see that the catheter is now passed into the portal vein and the tract is seen. Uh, because the hepatic uh, tips is usually done for cirrhotic patients, the hepatic parenchyma is usually very... Uh, um, very stiff and they tend to recoil. So what you have to do is you have to plasty the track with the balloon and stent it. So in this cases you use, uh, this is a marking pigtail uh, and each mark is around one centimeter. So based on the length of the track that you have created, you can measure the uh, length of this track and based on the measurement, you can select a suitable size stent and you can place the stent. This is a hybrid stent you can see that the stent extends from the hepatic vein into the right branch of portal vein. So the part of the stent that is within the hepatic parenchyma is usually covered and the part which is within the portal vein is uncovered. So this is an example of a hybrid stent. And the ends of the stents are usually called the landing zones. Okay, and they provide the stability to the stent so that the stent doesn't get migrated. And when you're doing a vascular interventions, you should... Uh, do a proper planning to detect the, uh, to assess the size and diameter of the stent that you're going to use. So it is important to know the landing zones. It is ideal to have a landing zone of 15 mm proximal as well as distal to the stent. So that is where your CT angiography or CT iotogram plays a role in uh, planning the procedure because you will have to plan the diameter of the stent that you're going to use as well as to assess whether the uh, landing zones are proper. There should not be any angulation. Uh, there should not be any plaques at the landing zones. And if uh, there is any anatomical variation, you have to modify the stent uh, or go uh, modify the stent ac accordingly. So the stents are usually custom made uh, and for aortic interventions are usually custom made depending upon patient to patient and the requirements. So this is the stent that we have placed and then the stent is expanded to the full size with the help of a balloon and then the final run showing the free flow of contrast from the portal vein into the hepatic vein and IVC into the right atrium. So coming to non-vascular stents, uretric stents, which is the most common uh, stent example for a non-vascular stent, they are called as double J stents because they have two Js, one in the proximal and the distal aspect. And uh, these, uh, the proximal coil is usually placed within the renal pelvis and the distal coil is there seen within the bladder. And the ureteric stent can be deployed anti-grade via nephrostomy or retrograde via cystoscopic approach. And the ureteric stents are usually available in various sizes. The more commonly used are six French and eight French sizes. 
and they're available in various lengths also. You have the 16 centimeter as well as the 26 centimeter length uretric stents, and these stents are radio opaque and they're made of plastic. And uh, if, if you have a very tight stenosis or a malignant stenosis, you have a, a metallic stent also available, just like uh, vascular stents that are metallic uretric stents also available, which are very expensive. And the main indications for uretric stenting are after uh, if you have any uretric strictures or any uretric diversion injury for, that has to be healed. And th those are the indications for uretric uh, stent placement. And uh, 16 centimeters is usually a small stent which you use for transplant kidneys because the length of the transplanted ureter is uh, less, you can use a 16 centimeter stent. And 26 centimeters is the uh, adult uh, uh, length of the stent. Now, complications of stenting include stent fracture, stent migration, and stent occlusion. And coming to the next part of the talk, which is about balloons. So balloons are nothing but modified catheters with balloon at its tip that can be inflated with the help of contrast. They're available in various lengths and sizes, and they're used for peripheral angioplasty, also a help in stent placement also. And they're also used as bailout devices when in case of vessel rupture. Suppose if you have accidentally done an angioplasty and the vessel has ruptured, you should keep the balloon inflated so that the vessel doesn't collapse. And immediately you can uh, pass a wire, remove the balloon and stand the area of vessel rupture. So this is used as an emergency bailout device and intervention. And uh, another use for balloons is to dilate in dilatation of stents. Suppose if you have a stent which is already placed and that is occluded, you can do a plasty of the stent with the help of a uh, uh, with the help of balloons. And the balloons are usually measured in millimeters, the length of the balloon as well as the diameter. The outer diameter is uh, the one that is taken, and that is also measured in millimeters. And the th important thing to remember by, uh, when using a balloon is that. Uh, you should use a size of the sheet which is appropriate to the passage of balloon. That is, the size, size of the sheet must be larger than the outer diameter of the balloon. And the principle to be remembered here is that once the balloon is inflated, it will never come back to its original size because of the property of the plastic. They will be The balloon usually becomes larger in size when it, once it is used. So the sheet has to be of appropriate size so that you can remove that balloon which is used. If, if not, uh, then you will have a very tough time and you will lose the, lose the vascular axis. So always remember that when you're using a balloon, the sheet should be at least one French larger than the size of the maximum balloon that you're going to use. And if you're using a very large balloon, like a 10 centimeter to a 10 mm or a 12 mm balloon, then you make sure that your sheet is at least like 10 French or 11 French size. And just like stents, the balloons must also be passed over a stiff, stiff guide wire. And the balloons are usually um, made of plastic and they have two markers at the end. And also you should remember that when you're doing an angioplasty, if it's a long segment plaque, then you should overlap the area that you're doing the angioplasty. And if it's a single tight stenosis, once you have crossed the stenosis, you should take a large balloon and make sure that the plaque is placed exactly in the mid portion of the balloon because the maximum pressure is usually obtained at the mid portion of the balloon rather than at the ends. So depending upon the uh, type, there are a lot of types of balloon depending upon a lot of properties. Uh, so based on the way the balloon is used, they have you have two types. We have the standard over the wire balloon and rapid exchange of mono, uh, monorail balloons. Standard over the length wire, over the wire balloons are, uh, it, it, it means nothing but the wire passes over the entire length of the balloon catheter, balloon catheter. So from the tip to the distal length and the entire length, the wire passes. Whereas rapid exchange of monorail balloons are more commonly used in cardiac procedures because you have to save time. What happens is that the wire does not pass through the entire length of the catheter. Instead, from the mid portion of the shaft, it just comes out. So it is very easy to insert as well as remove the balloon for rapid exchange. So that's why the term rapid exchange. And uh, balloons can also be drug coated or non-drug coated. Usually paclitaxel is the drug which is used to coat the balloon. And the contact time for drug coated balloon is longer. You have to keep it for at least minimum 30 to uh, 40 seconds so that the drug acts on the plaque and the plaque gets dissolved. And drug coated balloons are used in those cases where the chances of restenosis are very high. And the, the based on the property, they can be cutting balloon as well as smooth balloons. Smooth balloons are the one that is commonly used for angioplasty procedures. 
If it's a very thick plaque and you're not able to negotiate, you can use a cutting balloon. Cutting balloon has a sharp edge on the outer surface and it will cut the plaque and uh, make the angioplasty easier. And based on the type of wire that the balloon allows to pass, it can be a O35 compatible balloon or an O14 compatible balloon. O14 is smaller in size, O35 is larger in size. So this is how the uh, parts of the balloon. And the balloon is usually placed at the tip of the catheter and the catheter has two hubs in the distal aspect, one for the passage of wire, which is called a wire hub. And then you have the inflation hub where you connect the inflation device to uh, fill up the balloon with contrast. And so this is a standard over the length uh, wire balloon where the wire passes through the entire length of the balloon. And this is the rapid exchange of monorail system in which the wire comes out through the mid shaft. So it is easy for us to exchange the balloon. So it, save, it helps to save time during the procedure. And there are two radiopaque markers which are present on either end of the balloon and that has to be placed exactly in the mid pole. And, and there is a third marker. Some balloons have a third marker and the balloon should exactly be placed in the mid portion of the plaque. And uh, you should make sure that you have an appropriate uh, size sheath and the balloon should always be passed over a stiff wire. And uh, if you don't pass the balloon over a stiff wire, you can see that when you're inflating, the balloon just walks over. So to prevent that, you should make sure that the balloon is well stabilized. The wire usually, the wire should have sufficient thickness and stability. So this is a renal angioplasty that was done with the help of a 4 mm balloon. You can see that the balloon is inflated in the mid portion of the renal artery and the balloon catheter is filled with contrast. And these are the different uh, tips, uh, the tips of the balloon that usually comes in various sizes and length. So this is how the, uh, there are various sizes for, for the tips, various sizes and shapes for the tips. Now coming to physics of balloon dilatation, uh, balloon dilatation usually works on the principle of law of Laplace. You should have, you would have heard this term when you're learning your physics in your undergraduate, I mean, or in your school times. Law of Laplace is nothing but the distending tension or the outward tension, the radial tension that exerts outward is directly proportional to the pressure inside the balloon and it's also directly proportional to the radius of the inflated balloon. So it shows that the outward tension is directly proportional to the pressure and the radius. So once the radius increases or the pressure increases, the outward tension increases and this tension is the one that is responsible for disruption of the plaque. So what happens, uh, inflation is the term for uh, increasing the diameter of the balloon with the contrast and deflation is the term that is used to reduce the diameter of the balloon. And inflation and deflation is done with the help of a device called indeflator that will give you the pressure, the exact pressure uh, that is required for, in, uh, for the balloon for optimum functioning. So this is how the uh, plaque behaves when a balloon is placed. You can see the plaque and the balloon in the pre-inflation state. So once you inflate the balloon with contrast, you can see that the balloon is dilating. And once it reaches the maximum diameter, you can see that the plaque here, this area, the plaque is getting weakening, weakened. And once the balloon is inflated to a little more uh, maximum pressure, what happens? This area gets ruptured and the uh, whatever uh, uh, intima is there in this region, it gets prolapsed out. So this is what happens during angioplasty and the vessel uh, lumen gets uh, opened up. So to prevent this from uh, recoiling, you have to place a stent. So this is an indeflator. This has a channel which is used to connect to the balloon. And there is a pressure gauge here that will help you to measure the pressure in millimeters of mercury. And here, this is like a syringe which graduations and uh, you can fill up with contrast. Uh, because if you fill with saline, you will not be able to see where your balloon is positioned. So you have to fill the balloon with contrast. And depending upon the size of the balloon, if it's a larger balloon, you have to take appropriate volume of contrast. Now, when you're using a balloon, would I come to know about these terms called nominal, uh, nominal and rated burst pressure? So I will discuss regarding what is nominal burst pressure and rated burst pressure. So nominal burst pressure is, for example, suppose if I say it's a 3 mm balloon, uh, the 3 mm balloon is not 3 mm and it is packed. When it is collapsed, it is not 3 mm. So it is the amount of pressure or the minimum pressure that is required to inflate the balloon to its labeled diameter. So if it's a 3 mm balloon, uh, usually all the balloons in the packaging, they usually have a chart that shows the nominal burst pressure and the rated burst pressure. So this chart looks like this. 
So the says that at uh, six millimeter mercury pressure or six atmosphere pressure, the melon is three mm in diameter. So nominal uh, nominal pressure is nothing but the minimum amount of pressure uh, that is required for the balloon to reach its labeled diameter. So here in this case, the three mm balloon requires six atmosphere pressure to uh, to reach the diameter of three mm. And rated burst pressure is nothing but the maximum pressure at which the balloon will rupture. So what, what you should understand is the 3 mm balloon is not 3 mm at all atmospheric pressure. So you have when you inflate the balloon more, the, uh, the diameter of the balloon changes from 3 to 3.5 to 3.9 to 3.18 to 3.23 to 3.32. So maximum diameter that can reach is 3.33 at 14 atmosphere pressure. So this is the burst pressure. So after, beyond 14, the company does not give any guarantee that the balloon will work. It will rupture. So you should never inflate the balloon to beyond the rated burst pressure. And working range is nothing but the range uh, range of pressures that the, uh, the the balloon usually works, and that is between six and fourteen atmospheric pressure in this case for this three mm balloon. And the difference in pressure is called the working range. The difference between the nominal burst pressure and the rated burst pressure. So nominal burst pressure is nothing but the minimum pressure that is required for the balloon to reach its stated diameter. And the burst pressure, rated burst pressure, is the maximum burst pressure that the balloon can take before rupturing. And working range is the difference between the nominal burst pressure and the rated burst pressure. It is the pressures throughout which the balloon will start functioning. So what will happen if the balloon ruptures? Uh, just like a party balloon, if the balloon, uh, even the angioplasty balloon can rupture, Unfortunately, you're not going to hear a pop-up sound or anything. So you have to know whether your balloon is working or your balloon has ruptured. Uh, so what happens when the balloon ruptures? Uh, you can see that the contrast has just gushed out from the balloon and you don't see the contrast in the balloon. And you can see also no, notice that within the pressure gauge and the deflator, it will come down to zero because all, the, all your pressure is gone and it will just fall back to zero. So these are the signs of balloon rupture. And once a balloon is ruptured, you should make sure that it does not uh, damage the vessel. And if the vessel is torn, uh, immediately you should cross, if you, you should pass a wire and make sure that the wire is crossed the, beyond the point of tear and immediately place a stent graft or call the vascular surgeon depending upon the situation. So there are three patterns of balloon rupture that has been studied. You can have a pinhole rupture of the balloon, which is the most common. There will be a weak point of the balloon and there just the contrast just leaks out from this point. So this is nothing to worry. This has this is a less traumatic thing. The vessel do not rupture. And the second one is a circumferential rupture in which there is a circumferential tear. And the third one is a longitudinal tear in which the balloon ruptures throughout its entire length. And circumferential tear is the most dangerous type because you will not be able to remove the balloon from the vascular system once this type of rupture occurs because uh, the the uh, tone ends, they usually get reverted. And once they're reverted, they're of a very large diameter than the sheath that is available. So either you have to remove the balloon with the sheath and lose access, or somehow you have to manipulate the sheath and you have to remove the balloon. It is very difficult to remove the balloon if a circumferential rupture has occurred. And uh, longitudinal tears, because of the large length of the tear, uh, this type of balloon rupture is more prone for vessel injury. Now, as I discussed about the basic hardware in angioplasty, I will uh, once again um, let you know the like how do you go about an angioplasty and stending. Uh, so the basic uh, principle of angioplasty is that if the stenosis, <clears throat> excuse me, yeah, and the stenosis of more than seventy-five to ninety percent is considered for angioplasty and stending, and the main aim is to convert the stenosis to less than thirty percent with the procedure with the intervention. <clears throat> so first is from the, you have to cross the plaque with the help of a wire and catheter. <clears throat> you can either use a curved catheter and the straight wire or a straight catheter and the curved wire system. So the uh, crossing the plaque is usually an art and it depends upon your skill and the hardwares and type of hardwares and wires you use. So once you're successfully able to cross the stenosis, you can pass a balloon and plasty it. And once the plasty is done, you should place a stand of sufficient si size if you feel that the chances of recoil are high. So when you are uh, measuring stenosis in Doppler, there are two, uh, two types of parameters that through which you can measure the stenosis. Either you can measure it with the help of the diameter or you can measure with the help of the area. So the principle is that when you have more than 75% uh, to 50% of reduction in diameter, 
the area automatically reduces to more than 75%. So when the diameter reduces by 50 percent, the area usually reduces by 75 percent. So you should at least open up to uh, 75 percent so that there is only less than 20 or 30 percent residual stenosis. Now coming to peripheral aneurysms, this is one of the uh, like what do you do? What is the intervention that you do in cases of peripheral aneurysms? So you can either have a fusiform aneurysm or a saccular aneurysm. And it, the treatment of aneurysm usually depends upon the vessel which is involved, whether the vessel is a useful vessel or it, you, you can, whether there is a chance of that you can sacrifice the vessel. If that's a very end organ uh, supplying vessel and the vessel is very useful and cannot be sacrificed, and you can place a stem graft across the length of the aneurysm with the sufficient landing zones on either side. So this is a stem graft which is placed across a fusiform aneurysm. Whereas if it is saccular aneurysm, you can do something called uh, coiling. Uh, if it's a narrow neck saccular aneurysm, you can place a catheter into the aneurysm sac and occlude the sac with the help of coils. But when you're doing this procedure, the chance that this coil can uh, prolapse into the lumen, once the coils prolapse into the lumen, the whole vessel can get thrombosed. So to prevent this, uh, uh, if you cannot sacrifice this vessel to maintain the patency and prevent the coil from prolapsing, you can use the help of a stent. And this technique is called stent assisted coiling. And suppose if it's an unwanted vessel, it's a useless vessel that you think that you can sacrifice, uh, you have to embolize both proximal and distal to the aneurysm, which is called the front door back door technique. So what is the idea is that if you only occlude one side of the aneurysm, there'll be retrograde filling of the aneurysm from the other end. So even though the vessel is flowing in this direction, once you occlude one side, they will automatically what the body tries to do is there'll be retrograde filling from the distal anastomotic vessels and this aneurysm will get filled up. So the treatment of the aneurysm, you're not done anything by just occluding the vessel at one side. So you have to go more proximal, occlude the front door and then come back and occlude the back door. So this is a front door back door technique. And this is more uh, applicable in cases of uh, uh, pancreatic, uh, in, in cases of pancreatitis when there is pseudo aneurysms affecting the GDA. And this is the illustration for stent assisted coiling. You can see a saccular aneurysm in this vessel and you have placed a catheter through the vessel neck into uh, to the aneurysm neck into the sac. And then first what you do is you place a stent across this aneurysm neck and you cover, exclude the neck uh, from the parent vessel. And then you take a catheter through the struts of the stent into the aneurysm sac and then you start coiling. Once the coil, uh, once the aneurysm sac is thoroughly coiled and packed, you can either keep the stent in situ or you can withdraw the stent. And you can see that this coils, they're all completely packed and they do not prolapse into the vessel. <clears throat> now coming to snares, a uh, snare is nothing but a catheter with a loop of wire at its distal end that can be retracted inwards. Uh, so snare is nothing, uh, it's, it's just a lasso or a loop of wire that is used to grab onto something. So just like, uh, so, uh, like, just like uh, any, uh, any uh, so just like anything which uh, you can have a lot of intravascular foreign bodies that you have to grab. So in those cases, we can use a snare. And snares are usually available eight French and above, and they are nothing but a catheter with a nitinol wire inside. And the, uh, when you push the wire into the catheter, the distal loop enlarges. And when you pull out, the, uh, the wire usually tightens around the foreign body. And it is usually used for endovascular retrieval, retrieval of endovascular foreign body, or it can be used in rendezvous procedures. Rendezvous procedures is nothing but, as, as I told you in last class, uh, you have uh, various uh, procedures in which you should have uh, access from multiple sites. You, can, you should have a brachial axis or a jugular axis or a femoral axis. And then when you're working together in tandem, uh, exchange of certain catheters and wires should take place and those can be done with the help of these snares. So this is how a snare looks like. This is a catheter tip and a loop of wire just comes out. This is called a gooseneck snare and the snare is situated at right angle to the catheter tip. And suppose if uh, these snares are commercially available, but they are very expensive. Suppose if you're working in a setup in which there's no snare available, you can, uh, you can make your own makeshift snare with the help of a catheter. You can have a sta straight catheter of 035 compatible. And then what you do is that you take an O14 wire and you pass it in through, the, through this catheter, make a loop and bring it outside. So this can work as a makeshift snare. 
So once you push the wire outside, the loop will enlarge, and once you pull uh, pull the wire outward, the loop will tighten. So this is a case of uh, retrieval of foreign body from the heart. I'm sorry for the poor quality images, uh, but you can see this is a dialysis catheter that has migrated into the right ventricle. And this is a stair that we have used. This is a loop of wire that is coming out from the catheter and we successfully managed to snare and remove this intravascular foreign body from the uh, right atrium. You can see that we have caught hold of the foreign body and we have withdrawn into the sheath and removed the sheath. And uh, you can see that our anesthetist has refused to remove the ECG lead from here because he was very concerned uh, if there is any foreign body within the heart, they tend to throw a lot of arrhythmias. So this patient was having a lot of arrhythmias and once this foreign body is removed, everything, all the cardiac arrhythmias, they settle down. Now coming to IVC filters. IVC filters are nothing but devices which are used to capture thrombus from the lower limb and pelvic veins. And the main aim of this is to prevent pulmonary embolism. And IVC filters are usually used for uh, patients with a high risk of thromboembolism and who have failed medical therapy. And uh, usually the IVC filters are they usually placed in the infrarenal IVC. The length of the IVC filter is around 50 uh, millimeter and the diameter is around 30 mm. So even the largest size of the IVC, uh, 30 mm uh, IVC filter will suffice. And based on the uh, type, they can be permanent or temporary and the IVC filters can be placed either via the jugular route or the femoral route. So this is the placement of an IVC filter. They're usually placed below the level of the renal vein, and they're used to capture the blood clots from the lower limbs as well as the pelvic veins. And uh, that this is the morphological structure of the IVC filter. This is the head of the filter with the hook. Uh, the hook is uh, used to uh, retrieve the filter. Once uh, you feel that the patient no longer requires a filter, you can pass a snare and remove this filter and there are two uh, there are multiple long as well as short limbs for the filter the short limbs are called arms and the longer ones are called legs so this will provide stability to the filter and helps to attach to the uh, attach the filter to the vessel wall so this is how the radiograph of an ivc filter looks like this is an umbrella filter this is usually placed below the level of the inferior lowest renal vein So these are images showing uh, endovascular uh, filter placement and retrieval. So what you do is that you can place a filter either via the femoral approach through the femoral vein or the jugular approach. So this is a jugular filter placement uh, through the IV, uh, through the internal jugular vein, right atrium into the IVC. You pass a pigtail catheter and you do a KOgram and you assess the position on the renal veins. So renal veins, they do not get opacified when you're doing a cavogram, but you can see at one particular point, the contrast is getting diluted here. You can see that the uh, non-opacified uh, non blood from the kidneys are entering the opacified blood in the IVC and they form a dilutional artifact here. So that will help you to determine the position of the renal veins. So you have to make sure that the IVC is of normal caliber. There is no stenosis or thrombosis. And if there is a stenosis, you will have to plasty it with balloon before you do a filter placement. And once uh, IVC is, uh, you, uh, you assess the IVC and you find that it is normal, you can take the device. It usually comes with a sheath available and uh, the instructions for deployment are usually available with the literature along with the equipment. And once you withdraw the sheath, uh, once you place it in the particular position and withdraw the sheath, the filter gets deployed. And this is how you retrieve the filter. You have to pass a snare and catch hold of the hook or the head of the filter, and then you withdraw the filter into the sheath. So this is how you withdraw into the sheath and filter can be removed easily. Now coming to vascular closure devices. So most of the interventional procedures, they require a vascular access. And for some patients, especially if the uh, patient is coagulopathic, there's chances of bleeding from the access site. And also for all procedures, if you are, uh, uh, doing an arterial puncture, the limb has to be immobilized for six hours. So in patients who are at high risk for uh, bleeding and those patients who cannot be immobilized and they have to be sent home early, you can close the arteriotomy puncture site with the help of vascular closure devices. And they're usually used in patients who are obese, who have hypertension, and who are on coagulopathy or taking anticoagulants. So the advantage of using these closure devices is that there's less chance of hematoma and pseudoaneurysm formation, and the patient can be mobilized easily. However, the disadvantage is that once it is the cost, these vascular devices are usually very expensive. And second of all, these devices, they require a skill and learning curve. Like each device has a separate uh, 
uh, technique of deployment, which you have to learn. And they are broadly classified into two types. You have the suture based and the collagen plug based and each with its own pros and cons. Whatever is the type that you're using, the material usually gets absorbed within three months or two weeks, 12 weeks time. And it is not used for all cases. Suppose if you're using a sheet, which is less than five French, manual compression is enough. Uh, what you do is that normally after the puncture, you press the compression site, uh, you, uh, puncture site for 15 minutes. You give maximum compression. So that is why we are selecting the common femoral artery because it can be pressed against the femoral head. You have to press it for a uh, minimum of 15 minutes and make sure that it doesn't bleed. Uh, but this compression has its own merits and demerits because if the patient is very obese, the compression doesn't reach up to that level. And if the patient is hypertensive or coagulopathic, this still they can be continuing to ooze even after you press. So in such cases, it is better to use a vascular closure device. And it is more useful if you're using a large size uh, sheath, more than six French. So there are two types of uh, closure devices that are commonly used. You have the angio seal and the exo seal. And angio seal is a plug-based uh, suture, uh, plug-based closure device where you pass a wire and the closure device, and then that has a foot plate that attached to the arteriotomy site. And then a collagen plug is deployed over the arteriotomy site to close the wound from the external aspect. And exo seal is nothing but a suture mediated device where you uh, pass a wire into the access site and you pass the exo seal device and then you press a switch and then uh, the suture gets deployed onto the arteriotomy site. And when you pull it, the suture gets tightened. So angio seal and exo seal, these are the two uh, vascular closure devices that is used. And coming to the last part of the topic, which is contrast media. And most of the vascular procedures, we use a lot of contrast media, which has a lot of deleterious effect, including uh, 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 allergies, and uh, they can be of deleterious effect to the renal functions also. So to, uh, so to uh, keeping patient safety in mind, most of the contrast media that we use are non-ionic monomers. And they are the contrast agents of choice because of, non, because of the non-ionic nature and low osmolarity, they are less chemotoxic than ionic monomers. So non-ionic monomers are nothing but triiodinated benzene rip with multiple hydrophilic group. So they, because of the hydrophilic group, the chances of renal toxicity are less. And because they have no carboxylic group, they do not get ionized. And they're subclassified based on the number of uh, uh, iodine, which is present in one ml of the solution. Uh, based on number of milligrams in one, uh, one ml of the solution, they have different strength. You have 300, 370, 350, as well as 320 milligram per ml. So the common examples of non-ionic monomers that are used in interventional radiology are iohexol or omnipic, iopermidol or isoview, ioversol optiray, and iopromide, also commonly known as ultravist. So in my practice, I usually use Omnipec or Iohexol. So these are the two bottles that you can uh, commonly see in interventional radiology suits. Uh, Omnipec or Iohexol, which contain 350 milligram per ml of iodine. And if the patient is having renal problem or if a patient is post-transplant, we usually use Iodoxanol or Visipec, which is 320 milligram per ml of iodine. So this is less radio opaque than Iohexol, but it is safe for the kidney. So can you tell me uh, this green color cap, what does that indicate? For the contrast media bottle, you can see that there are different color coding for the cap. So what does this color coding indicate? You can see from the image itself, this color coding indicates the iodine number. So this green color means that there is 350 milligram per ml of this uh, iodine content of this contrast media. So one ml contains 350 milligram of iodine, whereas one ml of VCP contains 320 milligram per ml of iodine. So these are the contrast reaction profile axis. If the patient is prone to allergies or if the patient had a previous contrast reaction, it is better to do the uh, procedure under profile axis. So the different, based on uh, uh, different hospitals, they had different hospital protocols for profile axis. In our hospital, we usually give diphenhydramine 50 milligram or prednisolone 50 milligram injection, six hours, uh, 12 hours, six hours, as well as one hour prior to the procedure. And for to reduce the gastric secretion, we either give ranitidine or pantoprazole. And the procedure recommendation is that to use, we always use a low osmolar contrast media and uh, careful attention is given to the hemodynamic monitoring. That is, we try to hydrate the patient as much as possible with IV fluids before we start any intervention procedure. Only, unless and until it's an emergency and you cannot, uh, it's a life-saving and we do not uh, 
care we care, care about the renal function because the uh, because the life of the patient is at stake and if any patient is prone to anaphylactic reaction we usually give this prednisolone and diphenhydramine prophylaxis now principles of radiation safety as you know that interventional radiology has a lot of risk of radiation uh, the basic principles of radiation safety that is time distance and shielding is also applicable in our field and shielding includes both protective barriers as well as personal barriers so time distance and shielding is met you stay away from the radiation source you keep a distance from that you reduce the radiation exposure time and you protect yourself with uh, radiation protection measures so these are the radiation protection measures that we commonly use in the cath lab so there are certain principles that you should know before you do any procedures so this you can see that the interventional radiologist has followed most of the procedures uh, most of the set protocols first is uh, when you placing the uh, ii or the image intensifier it should be placed as close to the patient as possible because all the scatter radiation will get absorbed by the ii and less amount of radiation will go to the surrounding staff as well as the doctor and you should place the table away from the um, x ray tube as possible so the x ray tube is usually placed below the patient the intensifier is on the top of the patient so the intensifier should be as close to the patient body as possible and the x ray table should be away from the uh, x ray source as possible so this is the, uh, so these two things will reduce the scatter radiation to a large extent and also there are mobile shields and the skirting which are available with the machine so as much as possible you try to use them so that you don't have a direct Uh, visual contact with the x-ray whatever x-ray is there it is it will be shielded by this lead shield and you will not get uh, uh, exposure to your legs and uh, gonads also because of this skirting and you have to take your personal protection devices also you should wear a lead goggles you should wear a personal apron you should wear lead gloves and as much as possible you do not place your hand directly into the radiation field uh, so that you uh, take care that your hands are not getting exposed and there are ways to minimize patient radiation exposure dose uh so these are the principles that i was talking about keep the detector close to the patient collimate as much as possible you reduce the size of the field and make sure that the unwanted areas are not irradiated keep a shield between the patient and the operator wear a radiation safety cap wear a radiation safety goggles lead skirt and thyroid shield is important because the thyroid is more prone your thyroid is more exposed to the radiation field so you should wear a thyroid apron and disposable shielding and mobile uh, lead skirt is also present that should be used so ways to minimize the radiation exposure to patient is to limit the pedal foot time that your foot should not always be on the pedal because you are unwantedly radiating yourself and the entire staff and the patient so minimal foot pedal time and you should reduce the frame rate to less than 10 frames per second the more the frame rate the more is the radiation and you reduce the magnification simply for no reason do not magnify the images because magnification carries more radiation limit the number of runs and cine duration the more number of fluoro or angio runs that you do the more radiation dose so you limit those fluoro loops and on the whole limit the fluoroscopy time there are a lot of uh, values that show up in the monitor and warning lights that go off when you are uh, over over i mean you are overshooting the fluoro time so may you be mindful of all that and reduce the fluoroscopy time and avoid shallow angulations whenever possible do not rotate the tube into very steep angles because it it produces a very bad image and also it increases the radiation dose so only angulate if it is very necessary and avoid lowering the table from the iso center that is as much as possible keep the lab, uh, table stabilized in one position without moving up and down and place the image detector as close to the patient as possible as i told you and use magnified view only when necessary and as much as possible try to collimate so that the unnecessary only the required field is irradiated and unnecessary areas and un unwanted areas are not uh, are excluded from the radiation field so these are the re recommended daily uh, doses if su suppose if someone ask you what is the maximum radiation dose that you can obtain during uh, for occupational exposure is 50 millisieverts Which are accumulated 10 into age, 10 millisievert into the your appropriate age. That should be your cumulative radiation dose for uh, for the entire year or annually. Uh, your eyes should not be radiated for more than 150 millisieverts, and your thyroid and skin should cannot have radiation dose of more than 150, 500 millisievert. And uh, the embryo is at risk if the radiation dose exceeds more than 5 millisievert. 
and the public exposure to annual background radiation is around 3.6 millisieverts. So the stable is very important. Your an total annual radiation dose should not increase more than 50 millisieverts. Ice cannot exceed more than 150 millisieverts and thyroid not more than 500 millisieverts. So these are the uh, protection devices that are available in the cat lab. You should uh, know the lead content of each of them. So most of them is, is around 0.5 millimeters of lead. And except for the lead glasses, it is around 0.75 millimeters of lead. And the lead skirting, it is around 1 mm. All the others, it is around 0.5 mm of lead. And uh, previously, these used to be uh, very uh, difficult to wear because they are very heavy and they cause a lot of strain on your shoulders and back. But nowadays, it's a lot of lightweight, uh, li lightweight uh, variants are available of lead aprons, which are commonly used now. So thank you. With that, we come to the end of this talk. And these are my references. If anyone is interested in learning more about interventional radiology, you can go through these articles and journals. And if you have any doubts, you can feel free to contact me at any time. Thank you so much. And I would like to thank Dr. Amar for giving me this wonderful opportunity. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rajesh Venunath Naya for these uh, three wonderful talks which cover uh, everything that you need to know about intervention radiology. Not only uh, these talks are important for your board exams, but these are also great talks for somebody who is uh, keen into in, uh, learning about intervention radiology. Not a lot of uh, institutes have intervention radiology in their curriculum because they don't do a lot of procedures. So these would be uh, a, a, a good starting point for someone who needs to understand what uh, exactly is intervention radiology and what all we do. So thank you for taking out the time and for these three exhaustive lectures. Um, uh, if you have any questions, you can let us know in the comments and, or contact Dr. Uh, Rajesh Venunath Nair, and we'd be more than happy to answer this. Thank you, everybody, for attending this session live. For those who are watching this session uh, later, YouTube is recommending you this specific video for a particular reason. So check that out after you have watched this one. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.